listening to Text Me When You Get Home, a comedy podcast that discusses all things true crime and creepy. We tell you stories about murder, alien abductions, paranormal events and other spooky and macabre stuff. I'm Sophie. I'm Craig. And I'm Sean. If you watch us on YouTube or Twitch, then please like the video and follow us. Uh, wherever you listen, if you could just share the podcast with everyone you know, that would be really handy. Literally everyone, even your nana. Uh, Especially your nana. (laughs) To all you nans out there. (laughs) I feel like that would be your fan base, Sean, is all the nanas. nanas. Yeah, yeah. Have you seen that episode of Father Ted where... um, I can tell you already, no. Cool. Okay. Go on, Craig, my uh, love. Mrs. Doyle and uh, all the granny it turns it's like a zombie movie. It's all the grannies that love kind of like this uh, singer, um, like Dan, like Daniel O'Donnell kind of type, like a bubble. Uh, yeah, but he's uh, Irish and a bit um, um, mentally disadvantaged, and <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, it turns it's like a zombie movie at the end where all these nanas try and get at him. Oh, sexy! Yeah, Mrs. Doyle bakes him a cake and a jump a jumper and a cake. Sounds brilliant. So time to, get on. <laughs> <laughs> time to get on with today's story from me. Ooh. Mm. A short I one t- then, guys. <laughs> you might need to listen to something else on your commute as well. <laughs> um, so I'll be telling you about a woman that was only 18 when she joined the French resistance to capture Nazi troops sabotage German plans and fight against fascism in her home country. Ooh, um, sounds scary. Or true crimey. Or uh, it's to do with the war. So. Still. <laughs> it's interesting. All right, okay. Uh, uh, I have quite a lot of sources this week because during my research, it became very apparent to me that I know fuck all about World War II. Uh, so I had to Google every other word. So my sources include Wikipedia, like five times, uh, France Travel Planner, The Express, <laughs> uh, FacingHistory.org, National World War II Museum.org, Life Magazine, and all that's interesting. Oh, no, oh and they're slagging me off for using that. It's a good site. I don't <laughs> slag you off. I just make an observation. She this doesn't slag you very off, you different. precious, bold <laughs> bastard. Cozy bastard. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I see the difference now. <laughs> so uh, today is going to be full of soggy time machines. Thank you, Sean. Um, so first, I, all... I didn't do anything to the time machine, all right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so first of all, I'll be taking you back a short distance to Chartreux in 2016, a French city that's about an hour and a half drive from Paris mostly famous for the Chartreux Cathedral. So, fun, irrelevant fact, uh, it's known for being in an exceptional state of preservation with the majority of the original stained glass still intact. Uh, the cathedral managed to survive World War II whilst most of the old, time was, uh, old town was destroyed by bombs in 1944. This is because in 1939, when it became clear that Chartreux would be subject to battle, all of the stained glass windows were removed and packaged for storage. Oh, wow. So when you go there, it's just like it was back in olden days. Back in olden mm. days. As they say in French. <laughs> as they say in French. And people That's often right. say a perfect state of preservation is also what they say about me. Who says that? Name one person. You just told us about how no, no, stinky no. your fart was. Yeah. <laughs> that doesn't tell me that you're in a perfect state of pres- It tells me that you're rotting from the inside out. My mum says so. <laughs> Does she? <laughs> um, so, it's April 2016. We're in a nursing home near the beautiful city of Chartreux. One of the residents of the care home, 90 year old Simone Segoin is being presented with an award from the British military charity Soldiering On. The reward aims to recognise her achievements during World War II. Former Chief of British Army and Chairman of the Judging Panel, Lord Richard Dannett, wrote to Simone to explain why she had been chosen. The award is in recognition of your exemplary courage and devotion to the vital work carried out by the French resistance during the Second World War. 
The French resistance and your part in it proved critical in supporting our armed forces, especially those stand, uh, stranded behind enemy lines. So what exactly did Simone do during World War II? Especially what did she do to deserve the award? I hear you ask. I didn't ask her. She did <laughs> deserve the award. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, let me set the scene. Soggy time machine. Thank you. So, in August 1939, the world was pure like, what the fuck, Stalin? When Hitler and Stalin buddied up and announced that they had agreed on a non-aggression pact. For the past decade, the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany were at loggerheads. Nazi Germany was known for being big old Nazis. And up until this point, the Soviet (laughs) Union was known for being anti-fascist and anti-Nazi. So the Soviet Union before 1939. <laughs> say, anti-Nazi sounds like some Italian woman's <laughs> na- <laughs> like, Anti, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Anti-Nazi and anti-fascist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> so the Soviet Union before 1939 would denounce the anti-Semitic policies of Nazi Germany. So when anti. the pair. <laughs> <laughs> The like triumvirate some... of antis. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so when the pair announced that they were in cahoots all of a sudden, the world was mega shocked. Uh, Stalin provided substantial support to Hitler. In September 1939, Nazi G- Germany invaded Poland with help from the Soviet Union. Um, now, would you believe it? Hitler was a sneaky twat and backstabbed Stalin. You don't do that to Stalin. I know. <laughs> when I said this to Joey, he went, oh, can you believe it? And I thought Hitler was all right. <laughs> <laughs> That's a nice little moustachioed Austrian. <laughs> uh, who would have thought he'd do that? You know what I mean? Uh, so in late June of 1941, Nazi Germany carried out Operation Barbarossa, which was the code name of the invasion of the Soviet Union. What the actual fuck, Hitler? It's a fucking lunatic move from an absolute lunatic. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so apparently Stalin had been warned by intelligence sources and even Churchill had tried to inform Stalin of Hitler's plans. However, he didn't want to provoke Hitler, so he didn't take any defensive measures. So Stalin used appeasement very much like Chamberlain did. Chamberlain. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd say so. Um, so the uh, the purpose of the operation was to put Nazi Germany's ideological goal of conquering the Western Soviet Union and repopulating it with Germans ultimately they wanted to exterminate enslave, Germanize and deport the Slavic people to Serbia in order to create more Lebensraum or living space, I think I said that right, I don't know uh, for Germany okay I just, you know, I just used my gut instinct on how to say it and I didn't Google it and I was like, no, I'm probably right. (laughs) And I never do that. I doubt everything that comes out of my mouth. (laughs) Operation Barbarossa marked a massive escalation for World War II as it opened up the Eastern Front, in which more forces were committed than in any other theatre of war in history. The Eastern Front saw some of the world's largest battles and saw the most combatant casualties. Um, An article from the National World War II Museum of New Orleans reads, The fighting on the Eastern Front was terrible and incessant, brutal beyond belief. Both sides fought with demonic fury. The Germans to crush the hated Slavs and the Soviets to defend the sacred soil of Mother Russia. Atrocities including beheadings and mass rapes occurred daily. Millions of captured soldiers died of exposure and maltreatment. There's a member I was um, watching a documentary about the... Um, the siege of Stalingrad it happens in 40, 43, I think, 42. And basically you were called, this is the Russians, they, so you, they were called up and you, you were put in a line and one person in front of you would get a gun, yeah. the person behind you would get a bullet and you'd eat a set of bullets. And basically the idea is the person in front is going to get killed. The, the person behind them then takes up their gun and yeah. that's the way they treated it. And then there was more... Uh, apparently there's more ammunition um all guns behind by um the soldiers to stop people from deserting so if you even run backwards they just shoot you anyway oh, yeah. 
horrible. Yeah, brutal. Like I think the the Russians account for a, a ridiculously high statistic of war casualties during um, World War Two, and it was particularly as a result of the the German invasion. Well, you got to yeah. remember as well as the the Germans were absolutely off their tits on drugs. The Nazis were off their faces. The um, oh, really yeah. There's a really good um, documentary about literally. So one of the things that grew the only literally between the First World War and the Second World War and Germany was in massive depression, the one thing that did grow um, is the pharmaceutical industry in Germany. And that's why even now a lot of the, the a lot of the pharmaceutical companies have German names like GlaxoSmithKline and yeah, Bayer. And um, yeah, they were all off their face, basically on meth um, and various forms of speed. And But yeah, it was mostly meth. So okay. okay. The um the Blitzkrieg, they marched across France so quickly because they didn't sleep. The Panzer divisions. Oh, wow. oh, really? The Panzer divisions were just yeah, just and the same as we're like meth addicts now, don't sleep. They just got methed up to their eyeballs and Oh, that's and, crazy. Uh, didn't know that. Yeah. No, me neither. Travelled for like two days, took all of France. Oh wow. Um, <laughs> who says you, who says drug drug takers are win <laughs> losers? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well it's it's great in the beginning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that come down three years' time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it was at this point that the Frank Tireur et Partisans, <laughs> or the FTP, which is what I'll be calling them for the rest of the episode, uh, is an organisation created by the French Communist Party switched to support the armed struggle against the Nazis. Um, so to begin with, they were neutral. Uh, during the war, the FTP went on to sabotage and undertake assassinations of the occupation. In, nine, uh, sorry, in November 1943, the FTP chief of staff was arrested and tortured by police, but revealed nothing about the FTP. Then the police carried out a major operation which managed to largely destroy the FTP's Paris organisation until the 1944 liberation of Paris. So... Uh, the FTP... oh, sorry, I'm guessing that these were um, German police officers rather than French police officers, or at least French. Oh, I just assumed that they were German French. ones, yeah. Right, okay. <laughs> I think so, Sean, <Sure>. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so after that point, the organisation began to focus their efforts and prepare for a national uprising against the Nazis. Um, it was in support of the expected Allied landings in Europe. So by 1944, the FTP had an estimated strength of 100,000 men, dot, 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 and women. Uh, the FTP ran like a military organisation in, in and around the Paris region with sections, companies and battalions, each containing three lower level groups. The armed resistance garnered attention from war correspondents. Um, assume it was because they were considered to be the best organised and most effective of the French resistance groups. So one particular war correspondent was uh, that worked alongside the FTP was American-born Jack Belden. Uh, Jack was best known for traveling to the front lines to cover events from the soldiers and the villagers' point of views. Before his time with the FP FTP, Jack had previously covered the Japanese invasion of China in the 1930s. And in the late 1940s, he went on to cover the second half of the Chinese Revolution. Uh, Jack graduated with honours from Colgate University in the early 1930s and soon found work as a merchant seaman, seaman, seaman lol, uh, in, in 1933, he jumped ship in Shanghai and eventually learned to speak uh, Chinese. Jack secured work covering local courts for Shanghai's English, uh, English language newspapers. And then after Japan invaded China in the late 1930s, Jack was hired by United Press and soon after um, he was hired by Life magazine. Wow, sounds like quite the, the storied uh, guy. <clears throat> yes, yeah, well-traveled, uh, experienced war correspondent. Um, so it was during his t tenure at Life magazine that he went on to work on the front lines with the FTP. In one particular article from September 4th, 1944, uh, which interestingly cost 10 cents or $4.50 uh, $4 for a year subscri year's subscription, uh, which would cost us today for the year. What do you think? What year was it? 
Ten cents. Or what you're asking is ten cents or four dollars fifty? Uh four dollars uh fifty, yeah, four dollars fifty. And he asking us in dollars or pounds? Uh dollars. Fifty dollars. Sixty dollars. Uh it was sixty two dollars. Oh, well done, Craig. No points for Craig. Yeah. So in the article um from the fourth of September nineteen forty four, he wrote about his experience in the city of Chartres. So the article reads a couple of plat- platoons <laughs> a couple of platoons a couple of platoons of american motorized infantry had entered chartre the people had unfurled their flags and came out into the streets to celebrate but now uh, rifle bullets were snapping in the streets clustered about the cathedral the enemy was making the most of his limited opportunity to infiltrate back into our lines um Jack goes on to make an observation about the three types of women he can see on the streets. So, first of all, there were those wretches dragged in by the crowd to have their heads shorn because they had consorted with the Germans. I didn't realise that happened in France. I thought it was primarily in Holland. Well, it happened in Chartreux, mm. Sean, according yeah. to Jack. I remember I watched um, Band of Brothers... Yeah, and it yeah. was it was shown shown on that. Well, uh, I didn't understand why to begin with. I was like, why are they doing that to them poor women? And then it's because they were boinking with the Germans, weren't they? <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. I, I wonder if that if that was you know, if they if they had a choice either as well. What the women? Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's sad. Pretty traumatic. Oh yeah, yeah all around. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so the next type of women were the respectable women that Jack says, who no doubt had never slept with a German. Were they the <laughs> old? <laughs> the ugly ones. <laughs> it's, it's like homely women. <laughs> mm-hmm. mm. Yeah. <clears throat> and then finally, there were a large group of women who employed a radiant roll of the eyes and liquid curve of the lips to flirt patriotically with the americans so he's got his slags his good girls and his slightly slags yeah. german, german slags proper slags old slags <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, there was one woman however that stood out from the crowd <clears throat> super slag uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a bird? Super slag. <laughs> uh, Jack felt that she would not fit nicely into one of those three category, uh, categories. Jack wrote, When I first saw her, she was standing in the courtyard of the prefecture, munching on two large chunks of bread smeared with a thick, unsavoury looking jam. She, she needed... The jam's a slag as well. <laughs> <laughs> so jammy slag. Uh, she never. Yeah. She neither ch- uh, cheered the hair shearing nor flirted with the swarms of American correspondents. She was clad in a light brown jacket and a cheap flowered skirt of many hues, which ended just above her knees. About her arm was a ribbon bearing the legend FT- FTPF. In the ris- in the waistband of her skirt was a- stuck a small revolver. He writes like a proper old timey, you know. Listen here, say. <laughs> In the waistband of the skirt was a small, say. You know, like, it doesn't make, doesn't roll off my tongue very nice the way you write. Yeah. Not that anything rolls off my tongue very <laughs> nice. Um, what did I do? Uh, um, I think I said it on the episode before somebody on Instagram commented. I think it was Craig. Hello, Craig. Not you, Craig. Different Craig. Said that when I was reading something, it sounded like I had a mouthful of um, Frosties. Because <laughs> I just couldn't get my words out. Um so Jack went up to the young woman and started up a conversation, initially by asking what FTPF stood for. Um, so it was Frank Partisan Francais. Um, so he asked the young woman if he could interview her for Life magazine over dinner and she accepted. However, Joe, uh, Jack wrote that a grim young man came up and said a few gruff words, led her by the arm to a sedan car and drove off. A few gruff words. Yeah, that's what he said. Uh, like, what do you reckon they were? Get in a sedan. <laughs> <laughs> I have... Fucking slag. <laughs> I have onions in the boot. Get in the back. 
Uh, could have been, could have been that, to be fair. <laughs> that was quite spot on. What about you, Sean? What do you think the gruff words would have been? Um, what would they have been? I also it's have so- garlic in the glove. <laughs> It probably just something to do with, like, don't speak to anybody about it. But then it's like she's got the strap on her. All right. <laughs> she's got the strap on. Well, this so no, I didn't like, say strap coming on. Coming in with this, the strap on. This is why she didn't with fit into own. any of the categories. Because she, <laughs> yeah. she, was, uh, she was a pegalot, they call her. <laughs> uh, luckily, though, Jack ran into the young woman the next morning. Um, as he was walking towards the cathedral, he spotted a column of 25 German prisoners. At the end of the column was the young woman from the night before, nonchalantly holding a German Schmeiser pistol. Once she had taken the prisoners to the MPs... Why did that just... That just sounded like... (laughs) He was just holding his cock. (laughs) Holding a what? Schmeiser pistol. Uh, Holding a German's (laughs) Schmeiser pistol, or...? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, German Schmeiser pistol. Okay, lucky German. <laughs> I don't think that is lucky being led along by your Schmeiser pistol. <laughs> Depends where you're being led to. <laughs> um, anywho, so she, they led them to the MPs, uh, which I don't know what that was. Military I police. Figure it out. Okay, thank you. Uh, she walked over to Jack to pick up the conversation from the night before. The young woman introduced herself to Jack as Nicole Monet but we know her as Simone Sigoin. Really? I don't know how to... Well, it's Simone from earlier in the story, but I'm never sure how to say her surname. It's S-I-G-O-U-I-N. So Sigoin? I go for Sigoin. I mean, that's yeah. not what you sent me. You Sigoin. spent S-E-G or U-I-N. Sigoin. Oh, well, I spelled it differently as well. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's E, S-E. I think I've just spelled it wrong. Yeah, I'll change that. Um, so let's take it back in time again to the 3rd of October, 1925. Hold well on. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Very soggy. Uh, so Is that my new name? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sog- soggy Sean. Um, so, uh, 3rd of October 1925, when Simone was born. <clears throat> she grew up on the outskirts of Chartreux and was raised alongside her brothers by her mother and decorated World War I veteran father. In 1940, Simone was 14 years old and Nazi Germany invaded her homeland and forced her to drop out of school. Simone and her family retreated to the countryside to live on their family farm. In 1943, when Simone was 17 or 18, uh, Sigoin met Lieutenant Roland Borsier, an ex-engineer whose new job was to recruit brave young French youths to join the resistance against Hitler. After joining the FTP, Roland had become a high-ranking chief, but had also retreated to the countryside whilst in hiding after shooting a traitorous Frenchman, uh, and this is where he met Simone. Um, In an All That Is Interesting article about Simone's life, they have included a quote from Roland um, about Simone. Uh, I studied her her for a while to see what were her feelings. When I discovered that she had French feelings, I told her little by little about the work I was doing. I asked her if she would be scared to do such work. She said, no, it would please me to kill Bock. um, Or Bock. Bock? B-O-C-H-E. German soldiers, really. Oh. Oh. Uh, now, I don't know about you, but the bit that stood out for me was that he discovered she had French feelings. <laughs> You've never heard of anyone having, like, Skegness feelings or Scunthorpe feelings. They're exactly you? the same, just a little more arrogant. <laughs> well, the French feelings. <laughs> yeah. Sounds but, sordid, doesn't it? Sounds tacky. <laughs> oh, I got French feelings, yeah. Wee wee. <laughs> that sounded like what... that was if Nessa was French. <laughs> Gavin and Stacey. I tell you for why I've got French feelings. <laughs> um, so it wasn't long before Simone had committed herself to Roland's tra- training regime. He taught her how to operate German weaponry and provided her with her secret identity of Nicole Monet before fully initiating her into the FDP at the age of 18. Um, I'd love to be in charge of giving you both new names. Oh, no, she's already she's three. She's, she's three already thought it. about this, hasn't she? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I this have. Is, this is where she's probably spent the majority of her week. 
<laughs> studying, writing up the story is names for us. Come on, then. Let's have so, them. So, Craig, we. You, you would be Clive Squits. <laughs> Clive Squits. <laughs> Sean. Go on. Oh, yeah. I can, tell you, I can tell you're impressed with this one. <laughs> Your surname's Double Barreled. <laughs> You'd be Derek Moistanus. <laughs> It's pronounced moistness. <laughs> <laughs> How do you feel about your new names? I forgot my first name because I've distracted by my surname. <laughs> I want to say, Der- is it Derek? Derek. <laughs> Derek moistness. So it's it's Clive Squits and Derek Moistanus. <laughs> <laughs> and what would yours be? Well, I just put in all fairness, Sophie Hardbattle does sound like a secret identity already, doesn't it? So... I mean, it sounds better than ours. <laughs> oh, shut up, Clive. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm more offended by Derek than Moist Anus. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for any Derek listening. Some, some, Sorry some, for any Moist con- Anuses. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, Clive's not that much of a stretch from Craig, so I'm not that bothered about that. <laughs> oh, this just hurts me. <laughs> it's just squits. And Mr. Moistainus. Also, my pronounced squeets. <laughs> squeets and <Squeeze>. moistness. <laughs> Anywho, um, so Simone's work with the FTP started small. Uh, she was tasked with carrying messages between different <laughs> members of the group. Uh, as she, as the FTP grew, so did Simone's responsibilities. Bikes were the most common mode of transportation in uh, Nazi-occupied France because the Nazi had laid claim to all cars and public transportation had been mostly shut down. When you say bikes, do you mean pedal bikes <laughs> or motorcycles? Mm-hmm. Yeah, have you not seen pedal uh, bikes. Allo, allo. Everything about this is allo, allo at the moment. I was, um, I, I was waiting for the uh, the first person to mention uh, allo, allo. Well, it's not going to be me because I am young and hip. Um <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're, you're the youngest of us and, and the hippest pro- probably not probably oh not. shut up Derek Moistainus <laughs> <laughs> it's good now because I've got more ammo to bully with you with but I made it up <laughs> I know yeah <laughs> so you have nothing like no argument back because it's just all from my brain um <laughs> <laughs> this is where the reveal comes it's like and this story this week was made up mostly by Sophie <laughs> she never existed what would you do if I like somehow legally got your name changed <laughs> surprise <laughs> happy birthday it's not my birthday it's, bye <laughs> it's like that guy today you see him in the news he, um, he came home and <laughs> he'd been away for a few weeks came home when he was alerted by his neighbours because somebody had falsified his identity and sold his house <laughs> like, really? he got home and the new people the the house was empty and the new people were remodeling it <laughs> oh <laughs> like, no yeah brilliant i didn't hear about so that so if he can do that you can change his name to Cl- not clive Derek moistness <laughs> moist anus <laughs> it's, it's the, the s is sad it's moist anu. <laughs> You change it every time. I can change it my own made up name. Whatever I fucking well choose. Um, so yeah, b- bikes were the most common mode of transportation. Another one of Nicole's first tasks was stealing a German administrator's bicycle, uh, which she did successfully and then repainted it. Um, she soon moved to... Just, on just to scrape these fucking swash stickers off it. I know, yeah. <laughs> Uh, she soon moved on to becoming a liaison agent, riding the bicycle back and forth across the countryside between the various FTP groups. Um, so it's at this point that our two characters, Jack Belden and Simone Segoin, met up during her time fighting for the FTP. When they met back up that morning, Simone was able to tell Jack why she had to leave in such a hurry the, the night before. It was because she had been called outside of town to help hunt down a group of Germans in the woods. Simone and two fellow comrades had waited up until the, uh, sorry, had waited until the Germans got on the road, stepped out from behind a tree in front of the group and yelled in German, put up your hands. 
Surprisingly, and luckily, those in the front had been so startled that they obeyed Simone's orders and the other German troops behind them followed suit. Oh, wow. Nice. I know. Imagine, it only would have taken one of them to be like, no. <laughs> I mean, you shout anything Nine. in German and it's going to sound really scary, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to think if I know anything. Apart from... Heinchen Butterbrot! <laughs> I think that means chicken sandwich. <laughs> I think Heinchen's chicken or ham. I can't remember. <laughs> Except for mobile phone, which is a handy. <laughs> <laughs> my favourite is Natter Wissenschaften, which is science. Not a Wissenschaft! <laughs> uh, it always pisses you off, doesn't it, when I say that I can speak German and it's just because I say, ah, natürlich, at the end of everything. <laughs> but it works. What's the uh, ambulance in German is something mad like Krankenwagen. <laughs> it just means like <laughs> sick wagon. <laughs> yeah, natürlich, natürlich. Um, I always, mum used to uh, shout, shout me and my brother for um, saying art in German. What is that? Um, Kunst. (laughs) (laughs) Kunst. (laughs) Nice. Um, So, yeah, so they, like, jumped out in front of these, like, 20-odd German soldiers. Put your hands up in German is. Yeah, go on. Liga Dina Handerhoch! (laughs) So it is pretty scary. That would be quite... Yeah, that would be. And also, I imagine you'd be quite wet after that. If she was close (laughs) enough. They would be, Yeah. (laughs) Uh, so yeah, they were all startled and luckily they did, they stopped. So whilst um, chatting to Jack, Simone had, had had to quickly dart off again. This time she was to take part in a funeral ceremony for the Chartreux dead. She marched at the head of one of the funeral columns and then once the service was over, she returned back to Jack, sank down on the bench next to him and explained that she could only spare a few minutes as they had some work to be getting on with. See, this fa- this sounds like an aloe aloe sketch. I can only spare you a few minutes. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure it does. <laughs> um, <laughs> you cock. <laughs> uh, in that short time, she told Jack about the time she helped on a train exploding expedition. Uh, now, when Jack, Jack writes about Simone, he continues to call her by her secrets, cool spy name, Nicole, but to avoid confusion... Um, I shall obviously call her Simone. Uh, So he wrote in his article, the partisans were to blow a bridge, uh, the partisans were to blow a bridge on one of the main railway lines from Paris. And it became the job of Simone to guard the approaches to the bridge with a submachine gun. So in the night after the partisans had overpowered the bridge guard and set to work with their explosives, Simone lay some distance up the track in a, defiladed position watching all the approaches the Germans that uh, the Germans that time did not come and the bridge was successfully blown reminder Simone was 18 Uh, I I most definitely could not have been able to keep my call I wouldn't be able to do it now Uh, oh my god oh my god oh my god I'm scared imagine waiting for them to press the big red button about the bridge my asshole would be clenched (laughs) I don't even like it when there's balloons in the room that I'm in. <laughs> so your reason for failure of resistance movement is uh, there were balloons in the room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'd be no good. <clears throat> so during her chat with Jack, Simone told him about the night she killed her first Boch. She was hiding out in a ditch with two fellow soldiers watching out for German convoys. In the early hours of the morning, two Germans rode by on bicycles and Simone and her comrades opened fire with their submachine guns. Between them, they were able to bring the Nazi soldiers down. While the other two soldiers covered her, Simone ran out into the road and searched the Boch. She was able to take their papers and arms. That means weapons. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I'm a German soldier! (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I like the fact that you're Just like saluting with these fake arms. Is that right? <laughs> they were able to take these two Germans on on pedal bikes while they were lying beside the road with submachine, submachine guns. guns. <laughs> you're like, yeah, sounds absolutely. I think, yeah, I think they're able to do that. It sounds like a real good clear fair fight. <laughs> <laughs> um, then, whilst her comrades stayed by the road, Simone made her way back to the base alone through the woods in the dark to take the papers uh, papers and guns back. 
In his article, Jack wrote, she admitted that one of her companion's bullets might have done the job, but since they all fired at once, they all could claim the other bodies. During this time with Simone, Jack's colleagues uh, and renowned war photographer, Robert Kappa, was, uh, took some iconic photos of Simone, which I'll take you through in the show and tell very soon. Um, as mentioned earlier in the episode, after World War II, Jack Belden went on to cover other wars, such as the Chinese Revolution. Eventually, Jack went on to marry and divorce twice, having two sons, one with each wife, and eventually moved back to the States to live with his mother, where he worked on various jobs, including a school bus driver. Isn't that wild to do like a war reporter and then like a school bus driver? It's bad when you, uh, it's like all the vets from Vietnam that came back and went and did sort of mundane stuff (laughs) after literally being under fire every minute of every day. Mm. Yeah, it's crazy. He did eventually return back to Paris uh, and died at the age of 79 in 1989. After the war, sorry. No, you don't. I was listening to a, a podcast about um, Josephine Baker. Um, so Josephine Baker was um, a dancer, an actress in the 20s, and she left America because of how racist it was. And she found a new home in France. And she, this is very abridged. But because she became so popular in France, and she said, like, um, France gave me everything. She then helped with the war effort. So she would use her fame to carry documents because she had her own private jet and stuff like that. Yeah. So she'd then carry documents to help. So like like identity papers to then hand off to various um, Jewish people that she would would be in contact with so they could leave the country. Um, and she got all kinds of honors and she's like one of the highest, got one of those like highest decorated um, uh, French honors and stuff like that. And I wonder if that wasn't she was she, she a member of the like Nazi that? party as well? No, no, no. Must be well, if she was, it was simply to find out more. Getting, but I don't think she actually was. No, no. But she's a, a fantastic woman. There should be a movie made about her life because it's cr- crazy. Because she's um, yeah. she was like the um, you know when Martin Luther King gave his famous um, I Have a Dream speech. Yeah. She was like the warmer pack beforehand. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, she... Yeah. She's alongside him, dressed in full. Because she, she was um, a decorated officer of France, she's in full French um, oh, officer wow. get up. So I'm oh. just wondering whether she had some um, crossover between yeah, possibly. Uh, Simone and the um, and maybe Jack. What's his name? Jack? Belden. Belden, maybe. Yeah, maybe. It's mad um... as well, wouldn't you? You know, when you said one of her colleagues may have landed the sh- killing shot. <laughs> yeah. And say that, like, I watched a documentary about the First World War and one of the reasons it went on so long is that neither side were actually aiming at each other as much because both the English, in, especially in like Passchendaele where the English and the, and the Germans were, they could see each other across lines mm. and it just felt like most of the English boys were like, yeah, we're going to go over here and obviously um, empire building amazing nation and we've never been beaten at you know in their eyes we've never been beaten at anything this this was be over in a dash and then they sort of sat in trenches facing their any enemy for months and months at a time or years and yeah. uh, they wouldn't shoot each other and apparently it was very very different in the second world war yeah uh, so they went through a lot the germans especially went through quite a lot of realistic training to, right. to really, really rapidly uh, I think kill. I've heard about that before because didn't they like originally have to like shoot targets, you know, like with a bullseye, and then yeah. they changed it to like actually shooting dummies. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's like um, I'm, I'm reading a book at the minute called um, Human. So this is a bit of a digression. They've called Humankind. It's talking about how we're that. We, um, we want to do good and help people, generally speaking, and they're talking about an example of when they. Um, find all the muskets from like American Civil War and things like that. There was multiple bullets loaded in because that would always result in a misfire. And then because the muskets took so long to reload, they would never actually fire the weapon. Apparently, mm. only like, a very small percentage of guns were actually fired during the American Civil War. And it's because, like, like Craig was saying about in the in the First World War, soldiers don't want to kill each other. Mm. Um, so yeah. Yeah. Um. After the war, Simone became a pediatric nurse in her hometown. 
She also went on to marry the man who first recruited her to the FTP, Roland Bossier. As soon as you said she was, uh, what was it? He started to teach her his ways. I was like, yeah, but he did. Yeah. Straight I'll the, show you. Straight and he liked, he liked her French feelings. <laughs> yeah. Was um, he the gruff man that um, took her away when Jack was going to speak to her? No. I no, I don't think oh. so. He, did, he didn't say it if, if he was. He was there. Uh, Get in the car. <laughs> What were you going to say, Greg? I, I was going to say something really filthy, then I changed my mind. Go on, no, <laughs> no. Say, go on. I was like, obviously, French girl. She was obviously a Catholic girl. So she would have had to take her French feelings. So he would have had to take <laughs> her French feelings in somewhere that Jesus would allow. <laughs> <laughs> um. So, well, perhaps she was Catholic because they had six children together, which is a, a decent amount. Um. But she never took his name. She was always Simone Segoin, uh, if that's how you say it. <laughs> she might never have been Simone Segoin. <laughs> uh, when Simone accepted her award from the Soldering on Charity in 2016, she said, I was fighting for the resistance, that's all. If I had to start over, I would, because I have no regrets. The Germans were our enemies and we were French. The All That's Interesting article explained that Simone Segoin is the first to state that sh uh, she was no anomaly as plenty of female resistance fighters joined the effort to protect their country from tyranny. It is precisely this selfless, selflessness, however, and the courage she showed as one of these citizens that has turned her into a symbol of resistance around the globe. And that is the end of my story. I'll make a short one today. What a woman. But I just thought it was interesting. I like, you know, what I like about like hearing history stories and stuff. Yeah, definitely. And it's not strictly uh, crime, but was crime, you know. <laughs> the crime against humanity. You go for the big one. <laughs> um, it, it keeps all the way through that. Have you? Do you know a band called Art Brute? No. Mm. They've, no. they've sang a song called Everybody Was in the French Resistance and, and that's all that's been going on in my head. Go on, give, <laughs> us, give us a little snippet. It literally goes, everybody was in the French Resistance now. <laughs> like that. <Brilliant>. That's... <laughs> Great. So now for our YouTube and Twitch followers, we'll be showing you some pictures. If you are listening on one of the podcast channels, go over to Instagram. We'll upload them there. Simone to go in by the text when you get home podcast. So this is one of the photos of Simone captured by Robert Kappa, uh, Jack Belden's mate. Great photos. Yeah. And this is also her in her little <coughs> skirt with a big machine gun. <laughs> this is when she was 18, bear in mind. I like it. <laughs> do you <laughs> oh, i like that one and then this is jack belden there was a, a picture that i didn't include from wikipedia that showed him in the 70s probably like a couple of years before he died or 80s or 70s where he had like a big mustache hair down to his shoulders Fantastic. and it's yeah it's funny to see this must have been in like i mean 30s or 40s. He, he doesn't look like he can grow any hair no, and if he doesn't. did there wasn't enough brill cream left to style it because it's all on his fucking head <laughs> yeah yeah uh this is the city of chartreux was that the church it sounds about the cathedral it is yeah look how brilliant i think it was like built i can't remember the dates but i think it was like in the built in like the 1200s or something so imagine that being standing around today even well i mean it's, it's like most of ours though isn't it well, the, the 1200s. First, they usually yeah. find that they build the, a small part of it and then they slowly build it up over time, don't they? They build on it. Most of ours started at ten after 1066, didn't they? So most of ours are 11 and 1200s. Oh, wow. Well, I don't know anything. Um, this is the uh, photo that was taken in Chartreux of the oh, shaved shit, yeah. woman of Chartreux. So you can see the woman there, which is sad because mm -hmm. she's holding her child and yeah. then obviously just shaved her head. The, the child is probably of a German officer, so the shame is compounded. I mean, maybe, yeah. Because all the people on see... the right smiling at her as well. Yeah. yeah. That's where that scene from, um, I think it comes from, isn't it, in um, Game Bad of Thrones? Oh, um... uh, right. You don't know as well. I mean, they might have spent four years of her 
having Lord, extra, loading, it up, loading it up and having extra rations and all that sort of shite and just being a complete maybe you don't know uh this is simone in 2016 with her, her reward award reward award still award. would <laughs> joking <laughs> <laughs> He's both said it in unison, you pervert. He said award. I said award. <laughs> oh, I thought you went award. <laughs> <laughs> Mind in the gutter, you. Mind in the gutter. Uh, and that's the end. Can I stop showing? Yep. So yeah, that's the end of the show today. I hope you've all enjoyed the story. Um, Remember... Be safe and text me when you get home. Bye. Bye. Bye.